You're listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature podcast. I mentioned last week, Richard, on the intro to this program that you and I had a conversation with Father Paul, and we asked him to take a step back and revisit Genesis 1 through 11 a second time. He's talked again and again about how important originally Genesis 1 through 4 are, but then it quickly expanded to Genesis 1 through 11 as a kind of abstract for the entire biblical tradition. This is how classical literature works. I used to tell my students, if this literature is difficult for you to understand, it's because it wasn't meant to be understood on the first run. You got to read it and reread it and reread it so that it really becomes a part of you. Father Paul has talked about words and how they pop up for the first time and have a significance through the entire story of the Bible. This, in Father Paul's scholarship, is called the itinerant word. This is a very important dimension of his work. And sometimes, Rich, I think people hear Father Paul talk and they still think he's just talking. But I assure you there is a reference in his mind, a textual reference. And to help everyone understand this and to go on that journey with him of the work of identifying an itinerant word, we thought it'd be really helpful to revisit these texts and show in yet more detail what's behind many of the conclusions that he's surfacing for our consideration. Yes, it's wonderful to be able to go back through these texts based on already the information and the data and the explanations he's given us so far. It is truly a gift to spend some more time with Father Paul as we go back through these chapters and build on the knowledge he's already put in place so that we can learn more clearly and more accurately what is happening in these chapters so we really become familiar with the biblical text and are able to hear it accurately. I am happy to introduce Father Paul on the Bible as Literature podcast, Tarazi Tuesdays. I should like to go over Genesis 1 through 11 again, but from a completely different perspective. I would like to defend three things I have repeatedly mentioned, which puzzle my hearers. I know that for a fact. One is not only the importance, but the necessity of the original. I said it so many times. We have to be so serious about the original text, the way Muslims are serious about the Arabic of the Quran, the Quranic Arabic. Let me give you an example. People get excited about the fact that in the book of Acts we hear that Paul addressed his colleagues in Jerusalem in the Hebrew language. That's very nice. But how do you hear it? You hear it in Greek. So what Paul said in Hebrew is rendered scripturally in Greek by Luke in the book of Acts. So to discuss what do you do with that, you're losing your time. But I'm using this example to say when the people ask me, what is the language of God? My first reply is, which God are you talking about? There is only one. Well, I don't know, and we shall see this very soon. Already the name of God in the Bible is a plural name, which is very strange. But if you're talking about the scriptural God, which means the God of which scripture is speaking, well, obviously, whenever he opens his mouth, 
it's Hebrew. Period. So you have to submit. And it's not any Hebrew. It's the Hebrew of the Old Testament. And you have to submit to it. Which brings me to another point. But I started with the original because it has an impact of how I deal with my second point. What I call repeatedly, and I started this in my commentary on Ezekiel, what I call the trek, the itinerary of a certain word in a certain book. And my classic example, you could read my commentary on Ezekiel, is Ruach, which is translated spirit or wind or whatever. I mean, let's use the original Hebrew. And the other one, the Bika, which is translated valley and plain. So already you notice how the translations mislead you. You can't find the connection in the translations. And Bika is found only five times. Very strange. Twice at the beginning, close to one another. One in the middle and twice at the end, close to one another. But the funny thing is that at the end, it is connected, which is the raising of the dry bones. It is connected precisely with the spirit that is very important in Hebrew. And let me make a jump so that my hearers would understand where I'm coming from. And this struck me when I was reading Genesis. There is a word in chapter 11 that is not needed Notice the people, you don't make any comment about it because even if it is not there, it doesn't make any difference. And you know my theory on that. I keep telling my students, if a word does not make any difference when you take it out, then make sure to understand it's very important because of the question, why did the author add it? And that word is precisely this bit'a in the land of Shinar, where the people met together to build this city and the tower. And then this bika in the singular disappears until Ezekiel. I mean, there is something going on here. <laughs> okay, at least we have to ask the question, what is this word doing here? And then, no more in Genesis. With this, I move to my third point, which is ultimately my aim. You heard me saying this time and again in my coverage of 1 through 11, but now I'm coming from a different perspective to really try to prove to my hearer that indeed Genesis 1 through 11 is already the entirety of the scriptural message both through the words it uses and I'm asking my hearers to be very patient with me because at that point I have to go through the entire scripture and show you how it repeats what 1 through 11 said and then the thoughts expressed through the terminology Let's say when we get to the covenant, already everything is settled there. So it's a kind of what we call nowadays abstract. You know how you say to a writer, send me an abstract for me to decide whether we can handle this paper in the upcoming symposium. You know, But the abstract has to capture the entirety of your paper, otherwise it doesn't make any sense. Again, I'm saying it's an example. I'm not saying that the original writers knew about abstracts and so on. I'm giving examples, as you know, that I do a lot in my presentation so that the hearers can relate to what I'm saying, that it is not really an impossibility. We don't do this anymore. I'm going to show you again and again 
that we do it in the same way, but we imagine that we don't. So, three items, the original, obviously, then the story of a word, the itinerary, the trek. That's why when you discuss, you have to show me where it is and in which context. That's why when I say that a word disappears suddenly, what is it doing there? How do you handle it? And thirdly, that Genesis 1 through 11, you know my theory that it's already 1 through 4, but let me not push my luck at 76. I'll settle for 1 through 11. Perhaps someday, Father Mark and Richard, you challenge me and we redo the same thing on 1 through 4. But for the time being, I want to make sure that I'm not forcing the issue, at least from the perspective of my hearers. So please just listen carefully and do not only the best you can, a little bit better than your best, so that you can ultimately hear and see. Remember what Jesus said, if you don't have ears to hear and eyes to see, not that you have ears and eyes. But hear what and see what, whatever the message of Scripture is. So it's an effort on your part, as this entire work was an effort on my part. But now I'm forced to do an extra effort to have you understand the message I'm trying to communicate to you. And this demands a certain effort on your part. Regarding hearing the original, let me begin with this. I'll give you this example. Once someone sent to me an article which was published, I don't know where, you know, I just opened the link. Very interesting. and I would like you to hear me carefully. A young Jewish Israeli woman she heard about a famous woman, female professor of scripture in the United States. Was that young woman feminist or not? I don't care, I don't mind. I read her small article she wrote, in which she says, and I'm sure many of you are savvy in googling you can google and find just put the words you know and it is there and in the article she says i said to my professor that you and i are not reading the same scripture because we are not hearing the same scripture And she gave that example, which is classic, that you heard me giving so many times. But it's very powerful. And it's so simple that anyone who wants to argue against that will be immediately disarmed. She said in the article that she said to her professor that you do not hear the meaning of of Isaac, which means he laughs in Hebrew. You differentiate in your mind between he laughs and Isaac, because in your English you have Isaac and then he laughs. And the most powerful example, which I give always in my lectures, I ask the people, When does Isaac appear the first time? Obviously, it can be before chapter 18, because this is when he is born. But the sound Isaac appears already in Genesis 17, 17, where you hear in the text, that Abram 
fell on his face and laughed without going into many details. It will take time to explain that. And it's exactly Isaac. There is absolutely no difference between the two. And for my hearers, you know that later, every time we have a name, especially of the children, there is an explanation given which should tell us what? That in the Semitic languages, we do not have what people refer to as proper names. Names are given to people on the basis of what the noun of the verb means in the actual language, and you are propositioning your hope that that person would be someone like this. Now, let me jump to another example, which is very interesting, because even the explanation of Scripture does not cover the entirety of the intention of the original. In Genesis 29.32, we hear, And Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben. Now, someone who knows Hebrew would have a heart attack. There is no Reuben. There is Reuben in the menu of a Greek... <laughs> diner, but there is no Reuben. The Hebrew is Reuben. There is no way someone who knows Hebrew would not hear it as C. It's the imperative C in the plural. Ye, C, a son. Now you can figure out the explanation, for she said, because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, surely now my husband would love me. But then you have to continue. She conceived again and bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I am hated, he has given me this son also. Now go back to Reuben. It works perfectly. See, a son. And friends... Uh, I can't help you. You have to help yourselves by trying to learn Hebrew very seriously. I'm not saying Hebrew from a Jewish rabbi. I'm saying to learn biblical Hebrew the way Mitchell Dahoud, and I'll come back to this name, knew it. Another example, and you know how I teach from examples, very important classic, you hear it on all my podcasts and even in my book, that my name in Arabic, Nadim, means a table fellow, a companion of fellowship with whom I can sit and talk around a little bit of food and drink. And my late metropolitan Philip would love this name, although he forced me to change it when I was ordained. And then now that he's dead, I can say it. He confessed several times that he regretted it, but it's too late. <laughs> and he would say, Welcome, O oh my Nadim. Now, the interesting thing in this particular case that it makes sense in two directions. But that's the richness. This is just saying, welcome, oh my, and just a so-called personal name, or is it functional? The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.